be able to introduce Greg Swain, who's going to be speaking to us today about the art, the culture, the history, all of the elements that go that that come along with this very in-depth and, as you all know, and I'm only just learning, uh, fascinating and complex game of mahjong. Thank you very much, and Greg, after you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Paige, for setting this up. And thank you, Lynn, for getting your friends here. And I really appreciate it. This is my first talk in real life in two and a half years. So it's, it's a little bit overwhelming, but I'm so happy to see a room full of people. So I'm going to tell you all about Mahjong, which is the most popular pastime in the world. And there are many reasons why it's so popular, and you're going to learn about them today as I give my talk. I went to Smith College and I majored in art history. And then I went to Baylor University and I got a doctorate in clinical psychology. And believe it or not, the game of Mahjong combines those two different areas. It's very easy to figure out how um, art is involved because you see the tiles, et cetera. But there's a lot of psychology, and I think some of you see that at the table, but there are some hidden parts of, of mental exercises that I'll tell you at the end of the talk. So you have to stay till the end of the talk. Nobody gets to leave early if you want to hear all the good things about Mahjong. So I grew up in New York, and before there was air conditioning, people would set up tables outside on the sidewalk in the shade. And so sometimes I'd be walking by, and there would be four people around the table, and I'd hear these words like flowers and dragons. And I thought, oh my goodness, this sounds marvelous. And then they would say bam and crack, and then I thought they were swearing, and I thought that was kind of unusual. And then at the end of the game, there'd be all this laughter. And sometimes I would walk by close enough, and I would see these very very exotic little images on the tiles, and I got so excited. I was desperate to learn how to play Mahjong. I didn't learn how to play, though, until 2010, so not that long ago. And I have to say that it really changed my life. And I bet those of you who play the game can agree with me that it really has added so much to your lives and friendships, et cetera. And that's why um, one of the reasons why I think that Mahjong is the most popular pastime in the world. So now we'll go on to, you know, some people who some people say, oh, I play Mahjong, but it ends up actually being this version of the tile matching game. Now, of course, you're playing with Mahjong tiles, but you're not playing the game of Mahjong. I happen to like showing this set because um, this is my set, and a company contacted me several years ago, and I took photos of my set, and they turned it into one of these um, tile matching games, and I bought this set right up the road in Salem, and it was, it's really one of my favorite sets. It's really quite beautiful. So I want to show you that. So if somebody says they play Mahjong, but it's something like this, you know that they're not playing Mahjong, but if it's with my set, at least they're playing with the right kind of tiles. <laughs> so what is Mahjong? This is a cartoon that my husband did. It's a game, and it's very much like gin rummy, and no matter where you play it in the world, no matter what version you play, it's all very much like gin rummy. It's usually played by four people sitting around the table. And um, what I love about it is you don't have a partner, so you're not missing any clues or anything that they're telling you. And I really love the fact that all the discards are face up on the table, so I don't have to remember them. So that makes me really happy. I think one of the reasons that it is so popular is that there is almost nothing more exhilarating than when you put together your pattern, your hand, the right combination of tiles, and you get to say the word mahjong. I know it's such an adrenaline rush for me, and I think for those of you who play, it really is so exciting. And I think really that this is one of the reasons it is one of the most popular pastimes. I'm showing you this set. This is a very old set. This was made by the Mahjong Sales Company in the 1920s. And this was um, a, the standard type of set that, was, that existed for a long time. Here you've got, um, there, are, there are three suits. And there is a learning curve for Mahjong in case some of you don't play yet. I'm hoping that you will want to play after this talk. 
But remember when, there were, when you saw a deck of cards, it was really hard to tell what, suits, what the suits were. I was pretty good with the diamonds and the hearts. I couldn't tell the spades from the clubs at all. And I didn't know what the jack, king, and queen, or ace were. So there was a learning curve for cards. There's a learning curve for mahjong tiles. And encourage your friend just to take your friends to take a little bit of time to become familiar with the sets, because it really is worth it. But there are four suits in mahjong, and they're all based on money. So it's very easy to see how this can be based on Chinese coins. This is actually based on money, too. The Chinese, when they would carry their coins around, there was a hollow, there was a hole in the middle of the coin. So they would put a string through the middle of the coins, and they would tie them every 10 or 20 or 50 coins. And that way, they could keep track of how many coins they had. So those strings were known as strings of coins or strings of cash. And that was the second suit here. This is the third suit. And this is what we call, we abbreviate it to crack, but this is the word, our shortened version of the word character. Character is what we call every single written Chinese word. That's what we Americans call character. So here's a character down here. This character means 10,000. So in other words, a lot of money. I'm not familiar with any versions of the game that, make, that care, care about you know, what suit you're playing with, but I just always have to give the history of the set. So over here, we have what we call wins. These are actually dragons here. And they changed on some more modern sets. And I'll talk about that. But these are the green dragons. This is the character for phoenix in Chinese. This is the character for dragon. And then this is a plain one that stands for purity, et cetera. And these are the tiles. We call them flowers. But these are the tiles that the craftsmen were using to celebrate what was wonderful about China. Back in the 1920s, things were terrible in China. Their economy was down the tubes. Mahjong was really the only thing that was going well in China in the 1920s. And so they really wanted to celebrate aspects of their culture that they were excited about. So because this set was made for export, uh, they wanted to, the Americans actually wanted to show different parts of architecture that you would really only see in China or in Asia. And these are different parts of transportation. But the flowers could be anything. They could be gods and goddesses and heroes from their historical novels, etc. They could really be anything that the craftsmen wanted to celebrate on the tiles. And just a lot of the time, we didn't even know what they were celebrating. Everything seemed so odd. But anyway, there are ways to figure it out. And my, one of my books has some of the clues. So uh, the game really started as a card game back in the 1300s. And there were many different prototypes and different suits, et cetera. But the game of Mahjong really came together in the mid-1800s. The game was popular from the very beginning. Was, was always played by those four people around the table, but there was something that was really addictive about it. And it was so addictive and so popular that when the Chinese dynasties were having issues and they changed over, the game of Mahjong was blamed for the fall of the dynasties. Everybody said, those politicians are spending too much time around the Mahjong table. They're not doing their work. And they were blamed. Now, I will just speak for myself. But I know that there are times when I would much rather be around the mahjong table than doing my work. Just saying. <laughs> so, so anyway, so this, I'm sorry this is such, I have never done it on such a big screen before. This is Joseph Babcock. And it's very hard to get a good uh, resolution photo of him. But he's an American who was in China in the mid-19-teens. And he saw the game being played. And he thought it would be a popular game in the United States and Europe. But he knew that the wonderful multi-layered aspect of the game would be difficult for people. He actually thought it would be impossible for Americans to learn how to play it. So he simplified everything, simplified the scoring. And I always say that the dumbing, that dumbing down started with Joseph Babcock. Anyway, he made a game. and. Um, but he didn't just want to do a game that was exported. He wanted people to have a feeling about being transported to China. So he, 
he put the flowers in that were the transportation and the architecture, but he also looked at that second suit, which we call bamboo now, but it was really strings of coins or strings of cash. And he thought, we're exporting a game about China. What do people think about when they think about China? They think about bamboo. And because those strings of cash look like bamboo stalks, that became the second suit. And um, the, the dragons, what we call dragons today, were actually archery symbols. They had something to do with the game of archery. But he said, we can't possibly have a game about China if we don't have dragons involved. So he changed those particular tiles to dragons. His marketing department also came up with the idea of Confucius either having invented the game or played the game. And the thing is, Confucius had already been dead for over a 1,000 years, so he had nothing to do with the game. And, but if you read some of that um, early Mahjong sales company material, the catalogs read like Jay Peterman. I don't know if any of you have read those Jay Peterman. They really transported you to a different place and you weren't even aware they made up the whole thing. That's exactly what the Mahjong sales company was doing back in the 20s. They made up everything, but it really made people get transported to another place. So we have uh, Babcock to thank for that. So this is a cartoon that my husband, Woody, who's taking photos in the back of the room, uh, and I found when we were at the Library of Congress, and it's a cute cartoon by a man named George Clark, and you see that people were having a mar marvelous time in the drawing room, and some people are playing mahjong, and some people are dressed up in Asian clothing, and some people are doing flapper clothing, and so mahjong really was the thing to do in the 20s. Uh, and yes, here I am, okay. And they really didn't, people didn't really care if they were doing, if they were wearing Chinese clothing or anything. They just put on anything that was Asian. So it's like a pan-Asian thing. They just wanted fun. They wanted escape. They wanted to think they were doing something different. So I love this photograph of these ladies. As I mentioned, Babcock made his own set of rules and, and scoring. And soon, because Mahjong was really taking off, Soon other companies thought, well, wait a minute, he's really just exporting a set of tiles and a rule book. We can do that too. So all the other companies got into the Mahjong business and they made tiles that are basically all the same, but they changed the scoring and they changed the rules. So it meant that when four people were getting together to play the game of Mahjong, there could be four different ways to play the game. And so nobody could agree on how to play, which was quite sad, and it's why Mahjong fell out of favor in the United States in the mid-1920s, let's say 1926 or 1927. Nobody could agree on how to play. Now, certainly people kept on playing, and people were playing all over the world, but that's why it really took a nosedive in the 1920s, because nobody could agree on what to do. So here's the first book that um, I was a part to, um, Mahjong, the Art of the Game. And this is the first book to really celebrate the art on the Mahjong tiles. So back in the 20s, China was having the terrible time, but the Mahjong business was doing very well, and many very talented artisans went into the Mahjong business. And so they were part of the carving of the tiles, the painting, the carving of the boxes, etc. cetera. So, um, but nobody really knew what a lot of these images represented. And because Mao came into power, he, said that Mahjong was illegal, nobody in China could play the game, and he ordered all Mahjong sets to be destroyed, and the companies had to close down but to destroy their records too. So we don't know who these people were or how they did their craftsmanship, and those of us who care about this just have to try to reconstruct it. But that's why we don't really have a clear history on the game, it was destroyed. So I'm going to start at the top. This is, the wonder, this is one of the wonderful sets that's in our book. This is mother of pearl faces on a horn back. And each of these pieces of mother of pearl was very carefully carved. Um, something like uh, this could have like 20, 20 different um, marks just going up and down. So very carefully carved, very high end set. I think it's possible that the paint is even gold. And it's really, really a beautiful set. Um, 
oh, whoopsie. Here is another one of my favorite sets. And uh, this is bone on bamboo. So there's bamboo backing with bone in the front. And this is, a, the top one is a phoenix. Now the phoenix was the king of the birds and the phoenix wasn't like our phoenix rising up from the ashes. This phoenix actually comes out when the government is good and it's a very benevolent creature. So they, they have peacock feathers which you can see and the swirly things up there are the clouds. So here, here are clouds, here are clouds, here are clouds. So down here, I knew it was a dragon but I couldn't figure it out. I didn't understand how the dragon came together. And then I understood that dragons fly up in the sky. They don't need wings, by the way. They can just fly. And so sometimes their bodies are hidden in the clouds. Sometimes they're above the clouds. Sometimes they're below the clouds, which explains why the dragon looks this way. And Chinese dragons play with pearls. We don't know what the pearl signifies. There's a lot of discussion about what the pearl means. But basically, if you see a Chinese dragon, you will see a pearl. So look for it. The pearl should be there. Okay. Here are some goddesses. Now, everybody in China would know who these goddesses were. And this one here has her rabbit here. And the, then she's holding the rabbit in her arms there. And, um, so it's really quite lovely, but everybody knew the goddesses. They all were very familiar with their folklore. And here is, um, this, these guys probably were from one of the wonderful uh, stories that were written in China. Some of them are over a thousand pages long, but in these little store, in these uh, great novels, there would be little uh, stories within, and the Chinese would be very familiar with those stories, and they would know, oh, this is what that's referring to. I always say this looks like Marvel Comics to me, that everybody is busy having fights and everything, but it's really, it's really quite fun. I did want to point out that all of these words here, these are all different characters, and they translate to being different things on the tiles. And sometimes they actually refer to the images on the tiles, and sometimes they don't. So that's kind of a confusing thing, but we have somebody actually in Wales who's been translating some of the tiles for us. So it's kind of a multi intercontinental uh, work group putting together the history of Mahjong. This is another set of marvelous tiles, and up here you can see the, the phoenix right here, and you can see the dragon, and there's the pearl, of course, and you can see the clouds right there. And these are beautifully decorated winds, and then here we have some more people who probably are from an opera. Chinese operas were troops that would travel all throughout China, and basically everybody in China would have an opportunity to go to the opera. And the uh, operas, of course, had music and singing, but they had comedy, they had physical comedy, they had acrobats. There was something in an opera for everybody. So people really were familiar with operas and tried to get there as often as they could. And there were even posters about operas throughout the country. And if you ever have a chance to see a photo of a Chinese opera or see a Chinese opera, they're all still wearing these wonderful headpieces that you can see here and you saw on the tile before, tiles before. Children. Children appear in Chinese art on a, um, a lot of the time. And up until recently, the children would be little boys, and sometimes they were running around doing very little boy things. So here we've got the boys. They're about to have a parade. They've got their drums, and they've got their lanterns, and they're going to go have a lot of fun. I'm very happy to say that now we can sometimes see girls in Chinese art and on mahjong tiles, but it used to just be uh, boys. So I love this set as well, and I just wanted to show it to you because instead of the bams that we're used to seeing, we've got these, and these are called infinity knots. In China, often things are symbolic of, of different aspects of life. So the Chinese were obsessed with longevity, and they would have longevity symbols everywhere hidden in art, and you could recognize longevity symbols. And if anybody says, what does this symbolize to you, and you say longevity, you're going to be right about 75% of the time, because longevity symbols are really everywhere in Chinese art. And this infinity knot 
is, is one of them. Now, I wanted to show you this. These are some wins, and they are decorated with squash. Now, squash are representative of a, a desire for children. Squash have lots of seeds, and so the Chinese associated squash with the wish for many children. So you would often see that in mahjong tiles as well. And then here are just some cute kids having, getting ready to have a good old time again. This is something called a leisure set. What's kind of interesting about this is all the, after I've told you that it's all boys, we do indeed see some girls. I wanted you to notice that I had to place the tiles four, three, two, one. The Chinese read from right to left, so you have to sometimes put the tiles from right to left in terms of the, the numbers on them. So you could see tennis and swimming, and then the children in the middle are having a lot of fun. The, this one tile here always reminds me of that copper tone commercial where the dog is pulling down the little girl's bathing chute to show her tan line. So that's what I always think of there. And I love this one. This is like grown up, grown up fun. She's gotten some flowers here. She's waiting for her love to arrive. And there they are in each other's arms. So I love that. That's called a leisure set. This next set is an outgrowth of the leisure set, because this celebrates a Chinese wedding. And it used to be that when you got married in China, you would have to make sure, first of all, that your signs were compatible with the person who you were supposed to marry. So they ha would have to check that out. They would also have to check that the date that you were getting married was a good uh, auspicious date. They would have to make a visit to the ancestral or altar. Lots of things had to happen before you got married. And then there would be the wedding ceremony itself. And um, they would get married, and then the bride, maybe she got to the reception a little bit, I'm not sure. But basically, she spent the reception here on the marital bed, which is about the size of a studio apartment in New York. They can be very, very large beds. While her husband would be down at the reception having a good old time, drinking and watching all the entertainment, including acrobats. I mean, these, these weddings were a really big deal in China, but the poor little wife with her little red shoes was sitting up there on the marital bed, waiting. I can't imagine what shape he was in when he got back, but anyway. <laughs> So this is a celebration of international transport. And um, the Chinese were very excited about this. China had been closed off for a long time. And then in the mid-1800s, it opened up again. And so they were very pleased that now they had some train lines and some international shipping lines. And they were going to be able to do international trade. And we know how that worked out, right? <laughs> You didn't just have to buy a set if you wanted to play Mahjong. You could make a set. So um, this was a set that obviously some family made. Somebody had to do some etching into the wood and then painted these tiles. And then this, though, is my favorite handmade set. I think of it as a family project where probably the parent made the tiles unless they were able to find them. And the children got very involved painting all the tiles. And I think that these dragons down here are like some of the cutest things I've ever seen. They're just adorable. And that, to me, is the work of a little child. So these are all handmade sets. We're now going to mass produce sets. And they really started mass producing sets probably in the 30s and the 40s. This is a set made by Chris Lloyd. Chris Lloyd is a United States company that still is in the Mahjong business. They're doing fabulous, very inventive sets right now. So I have to hand it to them. And this is a set that they probably made in the 60s. And you can see jokers here. Jokers didn't used to be part, an official part of the game. The way we play now, the National Mahjong League, flowers were wild tiles, and now we have official jokers. And so when you see an official joker, it usually means that the set was made in the 60s or even a little earlier. But I just, I just love these dragons. I find them quite charming. So here is when the New York Times did a story about our first book, Mahjong, the Art of the Game. This is one of the photographs that they use. It's a day glow set. And uh, if you know anybody who tried to learn how to play the game and they couldn't learn how to play and they were learning with this set, there's a reason why they couldn't figure out how to play. Because 
This is the white dragon. This is the red dragon. This is the green dragon. This is a set for very advanced players. It's not for beginners, but it, I just love the way it looks. I love the day glow, and I've never had an opportunity to play with this set, but it would be fun. When you're at the Mahjong table, you've got three senses that are firing. You've got your sight, you've got your ears, you've got your touch. If you sit at the table long enough, you know those snacks come out, then you get the smell and you've got the taste. And so when you're at the Mahjong table, all five of your senses are firing away happily. If you're really lucky, your sixth sense kicks in too, and you can figure out what everybody else is doing and how to make sure that you win and they don't, but I didn't say that. But anyway, so it's, I think it's one of the reasons why the game is so popular, because your five senses are just really happy. So people all over the world play where, wherever and whenever they can. So here are people in China, but not to be outdone. Here are my friends on the Upper East Side in a pool in Manhattan. So uh, they're having fun too, and I had to promise that if I were there and they were gonna be playing in the pool, that I was gonna get in the pool and play. But they had to get their cards laminated and everything, but my friend Kelly, who's wearing the white visor, she got the set and she was uh, the table, the floating table, and was just so excited that she was able to uh, bring that into the pool. So I'm gonna look for that next time I'm in New York if she's playing. And here are some people, here are some ladies on a cruise. They packed their headlamps. They knew that the lamp wouldn't be bright enough on the balcony, and they weren't going to be deterred. And there they are, out in the middle of who knows where, but there they are playing Mahjong. So you've seen Mahjong a lot in popular media. We've seen a very important uh, scene in Crazy Rich Asians, and that was the Singapore style of play. Um, driving Miss Daisy and Mrs. Maisel both have the American way or the National Mahjong League way of play. Lust Caution and the jo Joy Luck Club have the Chinese way of play, and actually the Chinese way of play is also in Mrs. Maisel. And, but I don't want you to think that Mahjong is just played with um, people on this earth. Mahjong was also used by the Chinese to um, help the aliens understand us in the movie Arrival, if you've ever seen Arrival. So that was fun. So it's kind of an out of this world experience. This, whoopsie, this is a book, American Mahjong for Everyone. And this is a book, I'm sorry about the quality of the slide. I had no idea it was this bad. But anyway, this is a book that um, Toby Salk and I wrote together. And my husband Woody in the back did all the illustrations for it and all the step-by-steps. And it came out during the pandemic, and I think because a lot of people couldn't find teachers during the pandemic, and they wanted to learn how to play Mahjong, and perhaps they had somebody else in the house who wanted to learn play, to play, a lot of people did learn how to play the game with this book. And this book also has some tiles in the back, but we have a website that has some tiles that you can print up and use. Obviously, the tiles in the back of the book are paper, and the ones that you print up are paper. But it was a way for people to experiment, to see if they like the game, and they wouldn't have to spend very much on the game uh, to learn how to play. But we had a lot of fun putting that together. So the pandemic really took the wind out of our sails, and certainly those of us who play Mahjong were very affected by the pandemic, and it made us very sad because not only did we not see our friends, but we couldn't, see, we couldn't play the game we loved. And thank God for virtual tables. So this is one of my favorite um, websites, Real Mahjong. And during the first few days of the pandemic, the, um, it almost crashed because all of a sudden people realized, oh my goodness, we can go to a virtual table. And there were like 12,000 people playing Mahjong at a time. He had to really up, up the power of the website. And so, but thank God for real Mahjong because you can play with three of your friends. And I did that during the pandemic and we would have our cell phones on and we would be conferenced in. So it was very much like being with them at the table. Some people even did Zoom with their friends while sitting at a virtual table, which was helpful. And you know, th what's wonderful about any of these virtual tables is that there are robots. Those robots are available 24 seven. You wake up at three o'clock in the morning, you can go play some games of Mahjong with the robots. And if you beat them, you can feel really good about yourself because those robots only exist to beat you. So if you beat them, 
yeah. So here are some of my friends also, and they're, they're playing mahjong. It's no surprise that socializing is key as we age. The more we interact with people, the better it is for us, for our mental health, and for our brain health. And Mahjong is all about that. And if you play the American style, the National Mahjong League style, you know that there are opportunities for chatter around the table and conversations around the table. So even if you start playing Mahjong with three strangers, by the end of a year, those three strangers will become close friends. It's amazing how these groups of people really become a bit of a support group for people. There's even a saying that what is said at the Mahjong table stays at the Mahjong table, because all of a sudden you're talking to people about all of these things. You can't believe you're talking to these people about. And, you know, but it stays at the Mahjong table. So that's good about confidences at the Mahjong table. But there's something else that happens. And it's not just about confidences. There are things that you can take with you from the Mahjong game. They have done studies that have found out that if you play Mahjong once a month, and I know that's not enough for any of us, but if you play Mahjong once a month, the gains that you make at the Mahjong table during that month will last, during that one time, will last a month. So they've, um, so what's really marvelous is they found that Mahjong can help stave off Alzheimer's, that the gains at the table are helpful in staving off that disease and it can help with depression. And I think one of the reasons it can help with depression is when you're at that mahjong table, time flies by, you don't think about all the things that are worrying you about. You don't think about the news. You don't think about your aches and pains even. All you're thinking about is those little tiles in front of you, and so it's a whole vacation for the mind and you're using so many different parts of your brain when you're at the table because you have to analyze your tiles, what you get, you have to come up with some plans, try to figure out the odds of making your goal, try to figure out what the heck to do if it turns out somebody else has your tiles, what are you gonna do, what's plan B or even plan C? If everything goes you know, south, you have to figure out what you're gonna do so that you don't help anybody else win. So all these different areas areas of the brain are involved in a game of mahjong. We just don't realize it. So nobody here should ever feel guilty about time spent at the mahjong table. It truly is one of the best things you can do for your brain. I wanted to show you these sets because I always encourage people to play with different sets. And it's because your eyes and your brain have to go <coughs> and to figure out what it is you're looking at. These are all the same hand with different sets. And um, that's why I say try to play with different sets. Maybe some of these are too different for you to play with at first. But there are some sets that have little tweaky differences. I would advise you play with those. Make yourself be familiar with the fact that that's actually a flower and not a one bam. Do it because you're actually giving your brain a bigger exercise and you'll feel so much more excited when you can say mahjong, having played with something that was unfamiliar to you before you played the game with those tiles. I just have to point these out. These are absolutely fantastic tiles that were made by a set of guys who were in Shanghai in the 1930s. There were eight guys and they all got together and they designed some tiles and their names, Jim Davies and Mark Hanna are on the tiles and there are six other ones. But don't you love this? It says palm olive and these are the soaps. Here are the winds. They've got all these little sayings on the tiles that we're trying to interpret and figure out. And then, but I love, these are the, um, these are the cracks and they have fireworks, which is just so cute. So I love that set. And uh, so, but play with different sets. It's a really good workout for the brain. And. Can you explain the buffalo on top? Uh, the buff, oh yes. That's Gladys Grad's set. 
It's fantastic. It's a salute to the United States. And so she's got the buffalo, and she's got on some other tiles, she's got baseball images, and I think there are flags. So it, it's a really fantastic set that Gladys designed a few years ago. So if, if you don't play yet, I mean, if some people don't play and Lynn is around, get them over to Lynn so that she can teach them how to play. The best way to learn really is from a good teacher, and you've got Lynn right here. And, uh, but if Lynn's not around, maybe you could teach them with the book. But playing Mahjong is one of the best ways to make friends and you know, meet strangers and have them become friends. Lynn moved here four years ago, didn't know anybody in Manchester, and has like at least 80 friends in town just from Mahjong, just from teaching people Mahjong. It really is a miracle in terms of how it connects you with people really from the get-go. And sometimes people should just carry their Mahjong card with them whenever they go travel, and they can meet new people in different towns because that, that's how the game works. So this is another cartoon that my husband did, and it's just kind of fun with a teacher there, working with people. I'm ending my talk here with this set. This is one of my favorite sets. And you can see that people are at the Mahjong table. And this set, the words, the words on the tiles up here translate to a group of friends having a good time together. And that's what happens at the Mahjong table. You have a good time with people. You can make friends or have a deepening of relationships with people that you already know. You give your brain a good workout, and it's really just fabulous. So I'm wishing you all many happy hours at the Mahjong table. I would really love to be able to see you there. And um, thank you. Yes, questions. Yes, I'll happily take questions. Great, I have two. Okay. That always come up when I teach a Mahjong lesson. Needless to say, we play with the modernized sets. Right. I mean, I love seeing these, these uh, very creative sets. But the sets that we play with, and especially here at the library, the flowers are always, you know, scenery. The flora, flora, whatever. Yes. And they always have numbers and or the seasons on them. And I'm always asked, what is the purpose? Okay. Well, if you could yes. address that, number yes. one. And number two, one of the more difficult tiles to teach in Mahjong is the one they are. The way I teach it is that on every, in every set of Mahjong, the one they are is always a bird. Maybe you could address the origin of the one they are. Right, OK, I will do both of those. Um, OK, so on a lot of the flower tiles, you will see numbers one through four. And sometimes you will see some, ought, win, spru. So if you play mahjong the way the Chinese do, it's all about your seat at the table. So if you're east, you're number one. And if you're south, you're number two. Anyway, so if you get your, the flower that is your flower associated with your seat, you get extra points. And so too, the names on the tiles, it stands for summer, autumn, winter, spring. Summer is the, I think spring is actually the first season. So if you get a spring tile and you're number one, you get extra points for that. So they have those on the tiles just in case people want to play the Chinese style. That's what that's all about. It does end up being confusing to beginning players. You know, why, why do I need this number? Why do I need that word? And they're not even words, so. Although the word win is a good one, <laughs> short for winter. But anyway. Um, that's, that's how that comes about. And then we don't really know why the one bam is a bird, because those records were lost. But what I think is that, you know, if you have bamboo growing, it starts as a little sprout, kind of looks like a pineapple or something. And 
they might have just, it was just another opportunity, I think, for the craftsman to show off because the back of it can look like a bird tail and then they just put the bird on it and then they added, you know, peacock or whatever. But I think that, that it's possible that that's why the one bam is a bird. There were some other things that were mayflies and other different things really early, but that's, that's my feeling about it. The way, well, my conclusion was because I was taught that Mahjong, literally, loosely translated, is chattering sparrow. Right. So my conclusion was that it was possible the one man was derived from just the, the word Mahjong. Right. That right. the bird mm -hmm. was translated to right. the one man. I don't know. We can, all of us can have our theories. There's nobody to tell us that they're wrong. And I think they could all be correct, you know? <laughs> you know, it's all correct. So anybody else? Yes. Uh, I have two questions okay. also. Uh, you showed us a number of sets. I guess they're all the sets. What, what were the years that you were referring to? We had the pleasure sets, the transportation sets. What years, that, that's my first question. Okay. Uh, were, were those sets being used? And I guess this one, those records were probably lost at the mound. But was Mahjong a, a very active thing in Shanghai during the war with the uh, rescue of the Jewish population that was allowed by the Chinese to live there? Right. Until, of course, the Japanese came in. Right. So what role of the Okay. All right. So the first question was, okay, the dates of the, the sets. The first sets that I showed you, and I was talking about um, all hand carved, they basically, the bone and bamboo ones would have been from the 20s, and then we got into the, um, the leisure set, and that probably was in the 30s. So those all would have been the um, 20s and 30s. Once, once plastic came about and it was easy to mass produce sets, that's what they turned to, because it was a lot easier and they were able to crank out a lot more sets than the hand carved ones. The whole role of Mahjong in Shanghai is fascinating. I've tried to do some research because um, the, uh, the Chinese were, were rounded up and, pl and placed in a, in a ghetto along with the Jewish citizens when the, cha when the Japanese came in. And so I think it's very possible that there were some people who learned how to play Mahjong during those times because they were all in this tiny ghetto together. But Mahjong was a very big deal in Shanghai. But I don't know how many Jewish people were playing. I know that there were clubs there that a lot of expats played in. But I don't know who were members of the clubs. But I've often thought that every, when everybody was all really put in these tiny little, almost like tenements, the way the Tenement Museum was in downtown New York, I've thought that there could have been some exchange of, of information that way with the game. So you refer to the clubs, uh, are you talking about the 30s, the early 30s, or uh, could you tell us something about them, the late 20s? Uh, I don't really know that much about the clubs, but there certainly were entertainment clubs in Shanghai where people would go and play Mahjong. And so those would have been, those, I think those would have lasted until the 40s. I mean, I've seen, but I, I don't really have that information Greg. right here. Greg, I think a lot of those were private clubs. Yes. For the British expats, the colonists, had established a pretty nice life there. Right. And then uh, Japan right. upended everything. Yeah. And after Pearl Harbor, they, the same day, they attacked Shanghai and bombed it. They had been do, you know, disrupting the whole thing for years before. Was, was Mahjong then a popular? Yes. 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 Very popular. And that, but that's why those guys, um, I showed you that one set with the palm olive soap and the firecracker. I think they were all playing with those sets. That would have been in the 30s or early. I think, I think I saw that they were there in 38. So they, they would have been playing with their own set in, in some of these expat clubs. Yeah. And ironically, the Japanese wanted put up with Jewish people. They did not, you know, they were part of the Axis. And Germany had, you know, troops in, in Shanghai, and the Japanese said, I'm sorry, we do not share your hatred of Jewish people. Yeah. So they allowed um, they Jewish companies, ships, ships yeah. would sail. Shanghai was the only open port 
that would accept Jewish people. And ships would sail from Germany to Shanghai and then, you know, make other stops that were not so pleasant. Yeah. But uh, it's true. Yeah, Shanghai was an open port and they didn't require papers in order to, to get there. And so a lot of refugees went to, I think if, I want to say like 36,000 refugees went to Shanghai, more than any other country in the world. And they Something all like that. they basically survived the war. Yeah. The yeah. conditions were not ideal, but they, they survived. were not persecuted. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Um, one of my favorite things about Hong Kong is that the car changes every year. Right. What is the background on that, and who does it? Okay, there is a group, well, the National Mahjong League is run now by two brothers who are the sons of Ruth Unger, who was one of the presidents for, I think, about 50 years. Um, they, I don't think that either of them are involved with the card every year. They are, um, they have some other people in the office who work on the card, and they work on the card, I think it's three days a week, um, maybe five hours a day from October until December, trying to come up with some winning combinations and hands that could work well. And you know, it's a lot of, you, you, uh, it, it's very tricky putting together a card. So I think there are several reasons behind the card. I think it's really very good for us to have to learn new combinations. It's very good for the brain. And it helps the National Mahjong League you know, stay in business and to provide all the services and, and support that they give. So the sale of the cards is very, it's really their big fundraising thing every year and they, they do well and then they, they support our charities. So it's, it's a marvelous combination of things, yeah. And was that, I hate to, but was that the way it was years ago or when did that start? Well, the National Mahjong League was founded in 1937, and I believe that there was a charitable aspect to it. Mahjong throughout its history has always been used as a way to raise money for causes. And even in the 20s, they were using it to raise money for different causes. And then when the National Mahjong League came into being, they were using the um, Proceeds, I can't remember if it was card proceeds or just the game itself was being used for Jewish causes really around the world. And then World War II, they were, a lot of money was being poured toward Jewish causes overseas, et cetera. But there's always been a bit of a charitable aspect to the National Mahjong League. It was all about friendship and charity. Yeah. Anybody else? Lynn. I have <coughs> players that will ask me about their grandmother's sets, their great-grandmother's sets. Um, you know, I have some players that will say, oh, I think I have a bone mahjong set, which I know are so rare. Yeah. Can you please address when people want to get more information about their sets, right. what resources right. they can, can go to? Okay. Um, th yeah. <laughs> well, there, there are a number of things that can happen. Um, First of all, there's a Facebook group, Mahjong, that's it, and sometimes people like to take photos of their set, oh, this is the one that was my, was my aunt's set, and then people will quickly tell them what their aunt's set is. Um, there, we ha I have a catalog in the back, Mahjong is for the birds, that actually can detail some of the Bakelite and Catalan sets and give you an idea as to how collectible they are, et cetera, and the, so those will really just be the mass-produced sets. But, one thing that we that Lynn and Paige and I were talking about is that we might even be able to do something here at the library, which is like a show and tell. And I can bring in some of my sets, you can bring in your set, and we can show each other sets, and I can tell you about the sets, and people love hearing about other people's sets and the family things, sometimes the family memories that go with them. But I will tell you a funny story. I was at Bat and Kill Books, and they were having people play around tables, so there were like two, two tables, and I saw some ladies playing with a set, and I guess it might have had like Band-Aids on it or something, or maybe it was nail polish or Band-Aids, and I said to them, oh, well, you know that there are some stickers that you can get, because that's how they turn some of their extra flowers into jokers. I said, you know, there are some stickers, or you can find some matching tiles, and they went, 
no, this is the way my aunt played with it. I'm not taking that Band-Aid off or that nail polish off. The Band-Aid and the nail polish were part of the fa their family history of the set. So these sets really have a lot of meaningful history for people. A lot of emotions are in those sets. Well, she didn't get to get her prize then from those green stamps. You know, we all were actively collecting those green stamps. So I, I think I'd take one more question. Yes? Exactly what is the difference be between a Chinese set and an American set if you're looking online for purchase? Um, I would say do not buy a Chinese set because you won't have the jokers and it will be hard for you to find matching tiles for the jokers. Also, a lot of the Chinese sets won't have our numbers, so it's gonna be harder for you to learn those Chinese numbers. It won't have our letters for the wins, et cetera. So don't buy a Chinese set. You really just have to look for a, a reputable vendor that has a real a National Mahjong League set because it, it really would be too difficult to make a Chinese one really work for you for our purposes. Thank you all for coming.